We are here at the National Historic Trails Interpretive Center. The trail center addresses the Oregon Trail, the Mormon Trail, California Trail, and the Pony Express Trail. It didn't matter why you were going west, didn't matter which trail you were on. If you were going west, um, you had to come through Casper, Wyoming, because South Pass is the only pass in the Rocky Mountains that allows a wagon to be able to transverse that. Consequently, all the trails come through Casper, Wyoming. These early explorers, basically, you see the outline of the state of Wyoming. This square basically shows South Pass, whether you're going to the Great Salt Lake, whether you're going to the Oregon ter Territory for free land, or whether you're going to California for, for gold. Um, this represents some of the early explorers. The best known explorer in Wyoming is none other than Jim Bridger. He wasn't that well traveled, but he did a great amount of documentation uh, in his diaries. He was the first white man, we believe, to have discovered the Great Salt Lake. It's his diaries that the Mormons will later follow to um, the Great Salt Lake. When you compare Jim Bridger to another very famous explorer, John C. Fremont, when you compare his travels with some of the other e explorers, um, you can see how some were very well traveled and some just stuck to certain areas. But they're all important to the, the story of the trails west and why people came west. And these diaries that will be followed um, basically become the road maps for all of these trails down um, the, the way. And at the Oregon Trail Gallery, you will experience crossing the Great Platte River. We have just crossed the river um, in between Fort Laramie and Red Buttes here at Casper. We will be traveling on at Independence Rock, trying to get to Independence Rock by the 4th of July, hence the name Independence Rock. And again, we must travel through South Pass with those wagons in order to successfully transverse the Rocky Mountains. Oregon Trail starts in about 1840 with just a few travelers, and by 1870, 100,000 travelers have been on the Oregon Trail. If you could only imagine um, your father coming home and saying, I've decided to, we're going west to, to Oregon, um, please go upstairs, pack every, all of your provisions that you can take in, in one suitcase. This is uh, an interactive exhibit that our children will use. Um, they have to decide what they're going to take on the trail and what they will leave behind. Not everything fits, so they have to make a decision as to what will fit in the trunk and what will not fit and what they'll have to leave behind. Dad would say, tell all of your friends, all of your relatives, uh, goodbye. We're leaving at sunup in the morning and we will not be back. Uh, you'll probably never see them again. And oh, by the way, the trail is 2,000 miles long and we'll be walking the whole distance. We've now moved on to the Mormon gallery. This tells the story of the Mormon migration who left Nauvoo, Illinois and traveled to the Great Salt Lake. This is an example of a rhodometer, which was an accurate measurement of the distance traveled by the rotation of the wheel. Prior to the Mormon invention of the rhodometer, a small child would be assigned to walk next to the wheel with a handkerchief tied next to the wheel, and they would have to count the revolutions as they watched it, the wheel make one revolution. And that was no small task for, in the journey to the Great Salt Lake, this wagon would have made 371,160 revolutions. So the rhodometer was a much, much welcomed invention. Large portion of the Mormon population is living in Nauvoo, um, Illinois and they're basically labeled um, criminals and told to get out of town overnight, starting a large, large migration in a short amount of time. The Mormon Trail basically begins in 1846 and on up through the 1870s until Salt Lake City becomes the great Mormon city that it is today. And they're basically following the, the journal diaries and the maps created by Jim Bridger. Um, they will stop along the way several places thinking that they have found the ideal place just east of Casper here. Um, they established a camp and thought 
that that was going to be where they would end up, but they couldn't find enough water and then continued on to the Great Salt Lake. A great many of the Mormons could not afford a wagon and a team. Consequently, the church encouraged Mormons to travel to, to their new promised land, which was the Salt Lake, and the church would loan a handcart to a family, and then when the family got to the Salt Lake and got reestablished, they would pay back the church for the handcart, which would then be used to further others coming down the trail. This wagon cart had to be pulled at a particular speed in order to make 15 miles a day. If you went too slow, you would run out of groceries and perish because there's no grocery stores along the trail. You had to pick up the pace so that you got into the yellow. At this steady walking pace, you could make 15 miles a day, which was crucial to you getting to where you needed to be before the winter storms. If you went too fast, you would simply die of exhaustion. The meager rations that you are carrying will not replace the energy that you're expending and you will die of exhaustion on the trail. Chronologically, we have now moved to the California trails. California trails, of course, tells the story of the gold rush to California. Now, the newspapers exaggerated the story of gold at Sutter's Creek. Um, showing pictures such as this, where you could pick up a five pound rock of solid gold, put it in your pocket and live happily ever after. Those stories existed, but they were few and far in between. The majority of the miners that went to California, in fact, died broke. The real success story of the people who mined the miners, that was the people who were selling them picks and shovels and wheelbarrows and clothing and supplies, which was very, very expensive at the time. There was also stories of scams, where you could get to California in a real hurry, so using such things as air balloon airships and wind wagons, which really didn't exist. But you could buy a ticket to get to California, and then you would show up on the appointed time to catch the airship or the wind wagon. And they, of course, did not exist, and you'd be holding a worthless ticket. Now, during the course of the travels down the trail, a lot of times the your animals, if you were traveling on the trail, your animals would start to wear out and you would lighten the load. You would be throwing heavy things out like anvils and stoves and extra wheels, etc., just to simply lighten the load and spare the animals the misery of pulling this wagon loaded down. We've now moved on to the Pony Express Trail. In addition to the Pony Express delivering mail, which we'll talk about in a moment, there were stage lines operated by the Pony Express companies, Wells Fargo and Russell Maj Majors and Waddell. Now the wagon that you see is called a stagecoach and it's basically pulled by multiple teams over the same trail day after day, resulting in a lot of dust being kicked up. That dust would roll into the wagon. There were large leather curtains above each of the windows to keep the dust out. But if you chose to roll the curtains down to keep the dust out, you would raise the temperature in the coach by 20 degrees. The coach would be occupied by nine occupants. It seems rather small, but the average man of the time period stood about five foot six and weighed 120 pounds. The average woman of the time period stands five foot four and weighs about 90 pounds. Hence, um, there would be enough room. The very last seat actually folds up in the door. So when you pull the door shut, the seat pulls down out of the door, giving the ninth passenger his seat. You could only imagine the people that you might be traveling with. A man smoking a big old black cigar, a woman wearing too much perfume, children being seasick and throwing up in the coach. All those sights and smells as you bounced across the prairie with a great amount of dust rolling into those windows on a hot day. This is the other portion of the Pony Express Trail. This is, of course, the main purpose of the Pony Express Trail, and that was the delivery of mail from St. Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California. We oftentimes get the wrong impression from television and movies that a rider rode the entire distance, which is not true. Um, as you see on the map, there are lots of little stops and starts. There were approximately 25 home stations and 165 swing stations. A swing station is where a rider would simply change his tired horse for a fresh horse 
and gallop on to the next swing station, again getting a fresh horse. He would eventually reach a home station. A home station is where he would spend the evening and then the next morning he would catch the, the mail coming from the opposite direction and he would head it back to his other home station. So one rider would just do this loop, the next rider would do this loop, the next rider and so on until the mail was delivered hopefully from St. Jo Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California in 10 days. The Pony Express lasted only a, a little over a year and that was due to economic reasons. It was very expensive to operate the Pony Express. Uh, it was a j dangerous job. Um, this is an advertisement from the St. Joseph newspaper. Pony Express riders wanted young, skinny, wiry fellows, not over 18, must be expert riders willing to risk death daily, orphans pre preferred, wages $25 a week, which was a very large sum of money for the time period. But of course, uh, risking death daily is kind of the key to this type of occupation. The impact of the telegraph, of course, is spells the death knoll for the Pony Express. The telegraph comes across the prairie. Oftentimes, the telegraph lines were spread out just across the sagebrush because there were very few trees, even to this day, across much of the expanse of the plains. With the telegraph laid out just basically across the prairie on the sagebrush to keep it up off the ground, um, animals would run through it. Um, the Native Americans soon learned that the talking wire meant more white people coming down the prairie. They would oftentimes snip pieces of the, of the line out, using it for ornamentation purposes on their weapons and, and jewelry, etc. So the telegraph needed to re be repaired almost daily. The story of the trails ends with, of course, the Transcontinental Railroad um, bringing mass populations uh, very, very rapidly to the western United States. It also begins a new chapter uh, with the modern highways that we now have today. I hope visitors take away from the Interpretive Center here an appreciation of the people that uh, settled the American West. Um, they were not large people, they were just tough people with a mindset that there was a better life ahead of them. And uh, they set out with a strong determination and with a strong determination you can accomplish almost anything.